Good evening. You're watching the main news on HKIBC. I'm Sarah Wong. Our top stories tonight. Local COVID cases dropped below 2,000 for the first time in four days, but authorities warn it may only be temporary. The Hong Kong Palace Museum finally opens its doors after its launch was postponed by the typhoon. And London sees rainbows across town as the UK celebrates 50 years of the Pride Parade. The daily COVID case low for Hong Kong fell slightly today, partly because of yesterday's typhoon. But authorities are worried two Omicron subvariants may become dominant as more of their cases were found across the city. Isaac Lee reports. The city reported 1,828 cases today, more than 90 percent of which were local, ending a four-day streak of over 2,000 infections. But health authorities said the decrease may only be temporary. Since the number eight typhoon signal yesterday forced community testing centers to suspend their services. Still, they observed an additional 28 cases of the BA.4 and BA.5 subvariants scattered across several districts, taking the tally to 136. Most were locally transmitted, including two students from Class 5A of Chulet Cell Memorial Secondary School in Yunlong. The class has been asked to suspend face-to-face -face learning temporarily. Two airport ground staff members were also found to be carrying one of the subvariants. But authorities suspect they may have been infected by imported cases, since they occasionally work with airplanes. The Center for Health Protection also confirmed that the Hot Pot Foodie restaurant in Kuantong, where a BA.4 and BA.5 cluster has formed, met the government's ventilation requirements. 14 people contracted the virus after eating there, three of which were added today. Meanwhile, the Union Care and Attention Home added two more infections. Two residents of the home for the elderly had earlier tested positive. Around 30 residents living in the same floor have now been quarantined. Isaac Lee, HKIBC. Legislative Council member Stephen Ho, who met President Xi Jinping on Thursday, has tested positive for COVID. Ho announced on Facebook that he was confirmed with the virus yesterday. He said his sample on June 30th was negative, but produced an indeterminate positive result with a low viral load on July 1st. He clarified that he did not attend handover celebrations to ensure public safety. During Xi's visit, Ho stood in the middle, two rows behind the president during a photo session. Hong Kong's new Secretary for Justice, Paul Lam, says his team's primary mission is to maintain and promote the rule of law in Hong Kong. His deputy, Horace Cheng, added that he will dedicate himself to clearing up confusions people may have about the city. Macy Mock reports. Two days after he took an oath to become the city's latest secretary for justice, former Bar Association chairman Paul Lam wasted no time getting to work. In his very first blog post in the new role, Lam said the Department of Justice's primary mission is to maintain and promote the rule of law. He echoed his boss John Lee's words in the swearing-in ceremony, saying the rule of law is the bedrock of Hong Kong's success. The 54-year-old also wrote that he is ready to listen to people who may have doubts on the rule of law or hold different opinions. However, he made it clear he will express his stance concisely at the same time. Lam called on the public to uphold the rule of law together and spelled out the qualities that people should have. He said to build a society governed by the rule of law, one of the key requirements is for the general public to have a sense of community built on mutual respect, tolerance, willingness to compromise, and self-consciousness to abide by a common set of rules. Meanwhile, Horace Jern, became Hong Kong's first deputy secretary for justice, gave details in a separate blog post about his newly established role. 
Zheng, who recently resigned from the Legislative Council, wrote that he is now dedicated to assisting Lam in clearing up confusion and allowing local and international communities to have a better understanding of the real situation of Hong Kong. Zheng had also relinquished his membership in the pro-establishment DAB party to join the government. Maisie Mok, HKIBC. A mission to save missing crew members of a ship that sunk from the storm continued today. However, rescue workers were blunt in saying they were not optimistic. In our previous experience, I think the chance to finding them alive is very, very slim. I think if all of us here in GFS, our hearts will go to all the families of the uh, uh, missing uh, sailors and, and workers. And I do wish that we could you know, find some, some survivors. And uh, it will be, again, a miracle to do that. The industrial vessel had been working in the South China Sea when it broke in half from Typhoon Chava yesterday. Only three of the 30 crew members have been rescued, while the rest remain missing. The wind did not stop people from dropping by the Hong Kong Palace Museum, which finally opened its doors today after the typhoon delayed its launch. Museum chairman Bernard Chen said ticket holders for yesterday can visit on other days. Macy Mock has more. Against the backdrop of a number three tropical cyclone warning this morning, undeterred visitors of the Hong Kong Palace Museum lined up to catch a first glimpse on its opening day. Among them were this woman and her friends, who are huge fans of traditional Han clothing. This man arrived two hours before doors opened at 9 a.m. I'm very excited and I want to check out the Chinese antiques, he said. The $3.5 billion seven-story museum features over 900 pieces from the Palace Museum in Beijing, which will be displayed on rotation. Newly minted Secretary for Culture, Sports and Tourism Kevin Yeun said the museum is an important milestone in the city's journey to becoming an East meets West center for international cultural exchange. It is a place for local residents to learn more about Chinese culture and will help enhance tourism development, he said. There were also apologies from museum chairman Bernard Chan, who acknowledged ticket holders for yesterday's original opening day couldn't visit due to Typhoon Chaba, which triggered the city's first number eight storm signal of the year. They are allowed to come back within 180 days. Tickets to the museum cost anywhere from $25 to $120. Chan revealed about 80 percent of tickets for July have already been sold. He added that the museum will distribute a thousand units of NFTs to patrons in a lucky draw. Maisie Mock, HKIBC. Renowned Hong Kong film director and producer Alex Law has passed away at the age of 69. Law, who helmed the films An Autumn's Tale and Echoes of the Rainbow, died from a heart attack. Federation of Hong Kong filmmaker spokesman Tang Ki Tin confirmed the news today. He revealed that Law's producing partner and girlfriend was by his side when he passed. Law won numerous awards, including the Hong Kong Film Award for Best Screenplay and a Golden Horse Award for Best Director. His Echoes of the Rainbow was the first Hong Kong movie to win a Crystal Bear for Best Feature Film in Berlin in 2010. Clashes intensified between security forces and pro-democracy protesters in the Sudanese capital, Khartoum. <laughs> Demonstrators hurled objects at police armored vehicles, which had earlier doused them with tear gas. The crowd was demanding a restoration of civilian rule after the military seized power with a coup in October last year. The fresh wave of outrage was fueled by a deadly crackdown last week that killed nine people, including a child. The democracy movement also met a roadblock after Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok resigned earlier this year. 
Israeli caretaker Prime Minister Yair Lapid called Iran the number one threat as the military shot down three drones over disputed waters. The unmanned aircrafts were intercepted while heading towards the Kurish gas field, parts of which were claimed by Lebanon. The Iran-backed Lebanese group Hezbollah admitted to launching the drones on a reconnaissance mission. Lapid warned Israel's enemies not to test its resolve in protecting its interests. But for many Israelis, the cost of living instead of national security tops their concerns ahead of October's general elections. The prices of everything are rising, rising in Israel. It's just becoming impossible to live here. And this is why, as you can see, so many of us came uh, out tonight and, uh, to shout what uh, we cannot achieve. We cannot achieve uh, even rent for our apartment. We cannot achieve the basic price for the commodities we want to uh, purchase in the supermarket. Uh, people want to go out, don't have public transportation. So it's really expensive to keep a car and you say you have traffic all day and the houses are high, uh, houses prices are high anyway. The streets of London shone bright with colors as the Pride Parade returned after a two-year hiatus due to COVID. LGBTQ plus activists urged the conservative British government to do more to protect their rights. He is proposing a ban on conversion therapy that will not protect trans people. He won't reform the Gender Recognition Act. He is still supporting the detention in prison-like conditions of LGBT plus refugees who are fleeing persecution abroad. Until he makes those changes, those are hollow words. In my own choir, the guy who was organizing our Pride March was attacked by homophobes last night and ended up in hospital with his boyfriend. That shows, if anything shows at all, that what we're doing today is absolutely relevant. The procession marked the 50th anniversary of the very first Pride Parade in Britain. It's also the biggest one in London as over one million people attended the march. Police officers ditched uniforms to monitor the event on the sidelines, per the organizers' request. This as the London police were accused of institutional homophobia when investigating a serial killer who allegedly murdered four gay men. Foreign Minister Wang Yi visited Myanmar for the first time since the military takeover in February last year. Wang landed in Bagan to attend an economic meeting with his counterparts from Myanmar and other Southeast Asian countries. Beijing, as Myanmar's biggest trading partner, has not condemned the military coup that ousted the civilian government of Aung San Suu Kyi. The opposition denounced the meeting as the junta government saw the top Chinese diplomat's visit as a nod to its legitimacy. On to the weather now. Tomorrow will continue to be cloudy with occasional showers and isolated thunderstorms. Temperatures range between 27 and 30 degrees. The rain will gradually recede in the latter part of the week. Now let's take a look at the weather around the world. That's our main news for this Sunday night. Join us for updates at 11. I'm Sarah Wong. Thanks for watching. Good night.